naked Be invited into places like Tel Aviv Great software Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah <laughs> Does we want to back into that? You can use DNA Boy, those robots look cool performance Um, so, um, this talk used to be called um, The End of Rails. Uh, people said, this is really, really negative, um, you suck. So, I changed it to uh, The Illusion of Stable... This is so annoying, this bottle... Who threw this? <laughs> so, I renamed it to The Illusion of Stable APIs. Basically, this means nothing. But the great thing is we had so many uh, awesome talks already that I renamed it to Unconventional Obje Object-Oriented Computing. <laughs> I'm going to talk about object orientation and amoe um, amoe amoebas. Uh <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now the thing is, I want to talk about um, um, yeah, APIs, but not APIs. Uh, you might think of, yeah, JSON APIs or XML or whatever you use, and like documents uh, between servers and woohoo. Um, and actually, no, I'm going to talk about um, APIs in terms of um, abstractions for developers. So we use um, APIs in our everyday life as a developer. I mean, we're all developers, right? Who's not a developer? No one. That's awesome. So, <laughs> so um, when you uh, we we use abstractions in terms of uh, in forms of like methods or even um, f um, variables can be um, an, uh, um, form a type of an API, or we can use um, object graphs and the way objects interact or functions interact. That's all parts of an API. And APIs usually come in forms of um, like libraries. Okay, and the great thing about APIs is that you um, you use stuff without knowing how the fuck it works internally. And the great thing is um, that Mihao already gave this uh, introduction with the calculator, so I can speed this up a little bit. <laughs> so, for example, when I use um, a, a power plug, I have no idea what is happening inside. I mean, I know there's like voltage and ampere and whatever it's pronounced, and like it kills you when it's more than 0 0.1, and I have no idea. Like, I had physics in school, but forgot everything. So, the, the good thing is, I just plug in my uh, charger, and it'll charge my um, uh, Linux laptop, and uh, <laughs> the battery will last only for two and a half hours because only Apple has good batteries, like only Apple, and you have to buy them, and it's going to be like $4,000, but it's great. <laughs> <laughs> ran over. Um, so basically, when you use APIs from from like Ruby Gems or uh, Node.js or whatever, um, you are using an abstraction someone uh, created for you. Yeah, and that's great because you ha don't have to know the details, encapsulation, as Mihao uh, uh, called it. And the the important thing about APIs is um, that you constantly have to monitor what is going on with my API. Is it still usable? Uh, a, a terrible example is a login form like this is um, a way to, hey, hello, welcome, is a way to, to, to authenticate yourself, authenticate others, right, to a system by your username and password. And it works great. We have 100,000 login forms on this planet. And um, so someday pe someone said, actually, I keep forgetting my, um, my password because I, I don't know, like I party too much with Johnny and um, the whiskey was a bit too much. So let's introduce something like login via Facebook. And they added this to, um, to their uh, login form, and suddenly people could log in without their password, which is great. So those persons revisited their API, I know it's a terrible example, and decided let's extend this API and make it simpler to use, okay? And you can transfer this idea. Actually, you only see my weird head in the slides, that's okay. Uh, so you can transfer this idea to uh, a bigger picture. For example, Ruby on Rails, and please don't stop looking at this ridiculous diagram. Uh, look at my beautiful once white shirt. <laughs> Hello, why are you so late? <laughs> Last time I gave a presentation, he was in hospital with a um, surgery going on. <coughs> it was great. Um, so um, Ruby on Rails is using its MVC um, pattern to implement really, really complex applications. Yeah? So the abstraction or the API is um, basically MVC. We give you some buckets for code and you do the rest. And it's like uh, Rails does it, um, like makes it look really sweet and simple, like, hey, active record. It's like, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, I got like glasses and I'm a book and I'm a controller, I'm action controller. So you have like those three little s sweet MVC uh, figures uh, kind of representing the API, uh, the, 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 the 
the structural API in Rails. And then it's like, you know, uh, the way you write Rails apps is like, yeah, you have, like, I don't know, like a routing, and then it goes to the controller, and the controller does some data, and then the data comes from the model for active record here, and then it goes to the view, and the view renders it, and then the controller sends it back. So that's basically how we write applications. So that's our abstraction. Uh, that's the, the kind of highest level of, of abstraction you have in Rails. And um, that's great, because people like me, <laughs> who do not do enough programming can write applications really quickly without having to think about encapsulation and about how do I actually structure um, my code. You just start writing a Rails app, write Alexia, and it works, and that's great. Um, so, and um, it's so great that we even have a doctrine telling us how to write applications and that it is really awesome and you stop reading this. <laughs> So the Rails doctrine, written by our charismatic, intelligent, successful, and attractive leader, David Heinemar Hansen, says, I have no idea what it says because <laughs> I never read it. <laughs> I was only staring at the unicorns. Um, so the doctrine basically um, gives us strict guidelines how to write applications, and it says, MVC is the way to go. And the way we write Rails applications and the way we wrote Rails applications 10 years ago is exactly the way you have to go. And that is really problematic in my opinion because um, there is some little problems with Rails applications. Yeah? And those problems are not only reflected in my code or your code, in basically everyone's code. So people, famous people like uh, millionaires, like Mike uh, Perham for example, uh, figured that out years ago and criticized the way we write Rails applications um, uh, like, I don't know, five to, five to eight years ago. Yeah, like, uh, for, so he basically uh, nails it with like, people, after two or three years of Rails, you figure out Rails is actually only Ruby, so I can use more abstractions if I want to, if, if I can. Okay, because the problem in Rails is that you, what is that, a view. So we have like massive views in every project. You have like massive views because we don't have enough abstractions, yeah? We have, what we have is like partials and instance variables and locals and then you have this huge mess of like views. So they have like logic in every view and like, hey, wait, I need slim views, but okay, I can use like one or two conditionals and ah, like a loop and this and that. So you have like massive views with um, like, I don't know, like author authorization and grabbing stuff from the model layer and back and forth and decoration, all sitting in the view. The same sitting in, what is that? That is a controller. Um, the same in the controller. You have like authentication, authorization, you have polymorphic dispatches, you have model access, you decorate objects, you do business logic in the controller, uh, you do rendering in the controller, you do some, some callbacks are triggered from within the controller. So you have like massive methods and sta uh, actions in, in controllers. And you have the same in um, my favorite uh, layer in Rails, uh, in models. Like you have state machines and validations and callbacks and, and business logic and decoration code and everything that sits in the model. And that's because we have a doctrine that says M, V, and C. And if you add anything to that, you're doing it wrong. Or at least you're not following the doctrine and you <coughs> must be doing it wrong. So, and, that, and that's, uh, to me, that is a really, really big problem, and I've been working on, the, on solving this problem <laughs> for many years, because I don't see what, what is the point about sticking to MVC, like, uh, as if it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not married to MVC, and I'm also not married to Alexa, by the way. <laughs> so, um, I just want to, I just want to illustrate you the, um, the problem that arises with um, the, thinking that three simple primitive abstraction layers like MVC, um, that, that this yields certain problems, okay? So what we have in, um, in every Rails application is like you use active record. Active record itself is a great thing, yeah? It abstracts SQL from me, fantastic thing. The problem is that we also have validations in the model. So for example, I have a, um, I have a user class and um, I say the name can only be 20 characters, blah, 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 you know, the usual stuff. So I have my validations in the user class. And then I create a user and I say, for example, name sep, and this will, of course, break. My head is exploding. <laughs> hmm, sorry. Um, <laughs> so this is exploding because um, the name is not 20 characters, okay? So that's great, that's great. Like, my code protects me from unsolicited input, as we say in computer science. Um, now, let's say I have the same set of validations, but I want to create a user as an admin. So now I'm the admin user and I want to create some user object. 
and the name should be longer than 20 characters, yeah? So I am admin, so I can create a name with lo more than 20 characters. This is simply my business requirement. Uh, so basically, I want the first validation to be disabled in this specific context. When I'm, a user, when I'm a user, I want this validation. When I'm an admin, I don't want that validation. And this is something you will have huge problems in Ruby on Rails in the, uh, in the traditional MVC stack to implement that. So what happens is they, they figured out, okay, actually putting all that stuff into the model is kind of not cool, but we still do it because otherwise we have to rewrite Basecamp. Um, let's add ifs and else. So you start adding, <laughs> everyone is laughing. <laughs> is it actually on video? Ooh, <laughs> um, I need to go. <laughs> uh, so they added ifs and else, uh, like they do it everywhere in Rails. So instead of seeing the problem from structural from the structural side, they started adding conditionals. And I mean, do we like ifs and else in our code? Uh, actually, I don't like it because it makes it really unreadable and really hard to follow. And you you will always have a case where you forgot about this condition, and then this condition is run because you know, it's really messy. So ifs and else is not a good way to structure this. And the problem I want to remind you again is we have two different contexts. We have creating a user as a normal user or creating a user as an admin. That's two different contexts. Okay, and both contexts are handled in one class, and this is where the problem arises. Okay, and um, <laughs> uh, hey, animated GIFs do not work on Linux. That is terrible. <laughs> Too bad. Um, so, and, uh, and a really interesting uh, way to solve this kind of problem um, is the way Phoenix does it. Phoenix is, um, uh, written, uh, is a framework written in uh, one of the new hipster functional languages, Elixir, in case you haven't heard of it. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty awesome, I hear. Um, I don't use it, but um, I like it. Um, they also like me. That's cool. Um, <laughs> So in Phoenix it works uh, as follows. Look at this code. It's fucking great. It's like so many. Ooh, don't don't look like, like, like chill out. It's we don't have to understand every single line of this code. We just gonna look at it in a structural perspective because this is an architectural talk. So what what um, Phoenix does is it has one function here. It's called dev module user. One function per context. Okay, and in this context they define what fields are incoming into my, um, when, I, when I create a user, what fields, what input am I expecting? And then they have their typecasting and validations sit in that very function. So they have validations per context, okay? So instead of pushing those validations on the low level in the persistence layer, they have this function, it's called, where they keep validations per context. So instead of having code for two different contexts in one class or one function, as Rails does it, because we have a doctrine and we have to follow it, they have, well, they simply use two functions to handle two different contexts. It is amazing. And the funny thing is, it works. And when I run this code in user context, only the user code will be um, uh, evaluated and run, and only the user validations will be run, and if I run this in admin context, only the admin code will be run. It is pretty amazing, and it's a super simple, uh, a super simple con uh, concept. And um, funny enough, there is a cool new framework. It's actually really awesome, I hear, and it's also really like well written and uh, well maintained, good documentation, great logo, uh, su uh, incredible website. I also have a lot of stickers. I, I mean, I mean the, the, the creator of this, I know him, and he gave me a lot of <laughs> stickers for that. Um, the, way in Trailblazer, uh, the way this kind of stuff works in Trailblazer is more or less identical to the way in Phoenix. And the funny thing is we didn't uh, steal uh, ideas from each other. It's simply a kind of object-oriented concept, even if it's a functional language in Elixir, to handle that kind of stuff in different um, code assets, OK? So in Trailblazer, and again, you look at this code, you think, oh my goodness, this is so much code, I have no idea what this guy is talking about. Even the screen is really big, I can't understand, it doesn't matter. Again, structural. So in Trailblazer, we have one, we call it operation per context, okay? So we have an operation for to create a user as a normal user, and we have an operation to create a user as an admin. And we kind of have the same concept. You have the data, you define the incoming data, in a contract, so it's basically like the way um, it works in Phoenix. So we have name, email, age, and so on, and we have the validations sit in that operation as well. So again, the validations do not sit in the model, the validations sit in the level above that in the operation. And you can have validations for admin, you can have validations for the normal user. It's pretty amazing. 
the way we actually invoke that is irrelevant because we only have 30 minutes today. <laughs> um, so what, I, what we did in, in Trailblazer, again, the same thing, two different contexts. Instead of handling that in the model because we don't want to move away from MVC, we have two classes and we handle two different contexts with completely different requirements in two different classes. It's simple. It is exactly the way object-oriented development or programming was intended to be. <laughs> Do I have the same weird sounds uh, <laughs> as Paolo? It's it sounds great. That's great. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Even in my uh, t dirty shirt, I have this kind of, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, exactly. Hey, uh, but, uh, no, let's not talk about this. <laughs> so uh, so the, um, it boils down to a very, sim uh, very simple thing. Um, we have two different things to handle. Why are we trying to handle two different requirements in one class if we, have, if we can have as many classes as we want? It's a really simple uh, concept of decoupling um, requirements in terms of decoupling them in different code assets. And um, another um, we kind of the same problem is um, we had this uh, in Azure accessible in Rails, uh, I think it got removed in Rails 4 or something. So it's the same idea again, you might probably be bored and fall asleep because it's really early. So the same problem again, we, we have this Azure accessible and then you say like name, email, age. So you basically, it's not a validation, it's more like a filter where you say those fields I want to be I want to allow the user to pass into um, the, the object creation. Yeah, so I, I'm basically filtering out unwanted, unsolicited input again. Uh, so it's kind of it's not a validation; it's a filter. Yeah. So again, this is on the model level. So you can say, I want name, email, and age when I create a user in any context, because there is no way to specify the context. And um, so this works fine. Fine if I w when I create a user. As a normal user, I want those uh, uh, limitations. I only want name, email, and age. If I create a user as an admin, I don't want those limitations. I want to say, accept any input because I'm the admin. I know what I'm passing into the object creation. Please don't run this filter. And again, it is impossible in Rails. It'll, you, you will, um, you you will end up with like hacking either Active Record, or and that's what they did. They introduced a new abstraction layer called Strong Parameters, which basically um, allows you to define filters, uh, filter of input fields per context. A great idea, but implemented the wrong way. Because now this code for strong parameters sits in the controller. And um, I don't get it. So we have model. Model has a bit of validation code and some business code, and it has validations for the user context, for the admin context. Then we have the controller. The controller also has a little bit of code because it has strong parameters. One strong parameters for the normal user, one strong parameters for the admin user. And I don't understand what's the problem in introducing a new layer, for example, for validations, and just move both of those distributed code fragments into this new layer. What is the problem in having a new layer called validation in Rails? It is, I don't know, <laughs> for me, to me it sounds really, really conclusive. Um, and again, in Phoenix, it is exactly the way it works. You have, um, you basically define what fields are allowed to come in per context. So in in the uh, user function, you have this um, cast method where you, or function where you can say, I only want name and email in this context. And the same in Trailblazer. So we have, um, we, we have this contract per operation and you define the fields you want to be allowed to be uh, processed when you create a user. So we, in, in both uh, frameworks, and I know I'm jumping through this code really quickly, but it's not about the code, it's about the structure. I should um, print that on a shirt and um, make maybe 20 shirts and always put them in my hand luggage so I always have enough shirts. <laughs> so, so again, so the, the, the idea is again, uh, instead of pushing stuff violently into one class because you want to stick to MVC, you just use several classes or several functions to handle different contexts. It's so simple. Um, yes, so this is a um, uh, rant over about Rails. Uh, some 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 really um, uh, quick um, ideas about um, uh, about Ruby and the way they um, adopted to new requirements because it's this. I mean, I'm trying to point out if your code, yeah, if your API is not suitable anymore for new requirements. For example, you write those validations and then you find out, hmm, actually I like this validation, but not in this context. Then it is possibly time to revisit your 
own API or the API you're using and extend it or simplify it or change it completely. And a good example is um, when Ruby picked up the idea of um, the uh, lonely operator, also known as the Keanu Reeves operator. <laughs> so the idea of the uh, lonely operator or the safe navigation parameter uh, um, operator is that instead of, you know, you always have those long chains when you when you want to present, I don't know what this is, um, uh, the, the large version of a thumbnail of a profile of a user, you travel down those, uh, this long chain of, um, of um, method calls breaking the law of Demeter uh, 15 times. Um, code metrics will say, and you might get fired. So, um, and also the problem is that if, only if the former uh, like chain segment is not nil, then call the next method and this kind of stuff. So you basically, uh, want to say, uh, if user, then call user profile, and if user profile, then call this and that. So it's like a long chain of um, indirection to access some nested uh, attribute value. And it's really painful in Ruby. So what they did in Active Record, uh, sorry, in Active Support is they introduced the try method. I never use try, but the idea is not that bad. Mm, let's not talk about the implementation. <laughs> But um, so basically they kind of tr introduced a new method, they extended their API saying um, uh, if the profile is not there, then don't call the rest of this chain, which is kind of a good idea because it's uh, what we call a, a nil object monad in functional programming. I say we, I actually, I, I don't do functional programming, but I want to be cool. Yes? Oh, five minutes. Yeah, no, I have this, this professional presenter stick that tells me the time and has a green laser pointer. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, they introduced try, and try actually uh, work pr worked out pretty well, so lots of people uh, started using it. Their code still was horrible because they, you, I mean, it's another thing to discuss if you should have those long chains of indirection <laughs> in the first place. But what Ruby did was they picked up this problem. They saw there is a problem with long chain uh, indirections. Let's introduce a new operator, and they introduced the lonely operator. So this basically helps you on uh, the programming language level to, um, to solve the problem of deeply nested access of uh, values. And this is an example of, hey, we have a problem in our code, let's fix it. And let's fix it on the programming language level and not on the framework level. Because a language or a framework is only as good as the language um, allows it to be. Yeah? And if a, if a framework doesn't move forward, then maybe the language should push it to move forward and change its APIs to solve problems that are around. Another problem I have, um, I would like to see solved, and actually when I gave a similar presentation at Euroco, I was trying to put some pressure on the Ruby core team, it actually worked. So another problem I ha we have in Ruby is when you create, when you use, um, uh, when you have classes and you wanna use namespacing in Ruby, yeah? So re really simple example, I have this class user derived from active record in some special file, and um, I have this class um, create that I want to nest into the user um, into the user class. So this is namespacing in Ruby, and it's really hard in Ruby because if I load the files in the in the wrong uh, in the wrong order, uh, you know, n uh, Ruby might say, "Hey, I don't know the user class, but uh, here create," and I p put create in the top level. So it's like really hard to to um, to, to use namespacing in Ruby because it's really um, important to have the right order, you load the files, and the files always have redundancy. I mean, you see, we always have like inherits from active record base, you also inherits from active record base. So I have to know what the top level, I'm, on no, I'm not interested in the user class, I'm only interested in the user namespace. And I still have to know that it is an active record base class. So the idea was that we have a new keyword called namespace user, and Ruby will now know, okay, he is interested in the user, he or she, because we also have lots of Ruby developers who are girls, which is great. Um, they will load, um, the Ruby will see, okay, they are interested in the user key, uh, namespace, let's let me find the correct constant for that. So I don't have this redundancy anymore that I have to redeclare classes just to make Ruby's uh, namespacing uh, work. So it's basically a problem you have when you use namespacing. Rails doesn't use namespacing a lot. We in Trailblazer use namespacing a lot and it is really painful. So I would wish that the Ruby core team would tackle this problem. I actually introduced them to the solution and they said, it's a pretty great thing. We will write it in the next decade. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to um, to finalize uh, my thoughts, uh, finally after um, uh, 27 minutes, 
Um, the idea of APIs is fantastic, okay? You have an abstraction you provide to developers to make their lives easier or your own life. You help them solving problems without them having to know what happens on the inside. But that doesn't mean that you wrote perfect code and it's going to stay like that forever. So you always have to revisit your own APIs or other people's APIs and think about does this actually still solve the problem or are we completely lost and we are actually not, we're actually like u using this API because we have to. Yeah, an example is Rails MVC. Like we, we have way com more complex software now. We, you can't just use three abstraction layers, throw all the code into three layers and say, this is awesome because our API is MVC. So changing an API is highly, highly important. And I mean, always think of this beautiful login form. It made everyone's life easier because they changed the way the API of authentication in this um, context. And um, I wish that, that the Rails core team would also pick up this idea of like, hey, we, have, we actually have problems, we have massive models, we have massive controllers, let's add something to fix it. And I'm not saying that Rails is bad, they have made a great job in the past uh, 10 years or 12 years, I think, or was it 12 years, uh, it doesn't matter. But the problem is they only add features on top, on top, on top, on top, and I would say the, the, the fundamental design flaws are still the same. We still have MVC and we, we have massive classes that try to solve very simple problems. Um, so again, changing your APIs or other people's APIs is not, is not a fault. Actually, if you change stuff, it means you are innovating your code. And innovation is always a good thing because you are trying to solve a problem. And just because you solved that problem 10 years ago doesn't mean that it's still the same solution, that the solution is still working, okay? So if you change APIs or if you change libraries, you are doing the right thing. I'm a big fan of um, sunsets. Maybe uh, we can all go tonight and have a uh, beer at the beach and watch the sunset. It's uh, the right direction, right? It's west, so yeah, the sun goes down in the west. That's awesome. And um, you can also, if you want, only if you want, chat with me on Twitter or in real life. You have been a great audience. Thank you so much.